Hello, we're the Malt Miller, and today, as part of our Brew With Us series, we're at Utopian Brewery in Devon. We're delighted to have the recipe for Utopian's British Lager, and that's what we're going to brew today here. I've got Jeremy with me, who's their head brewer, uh, and Jeremy's kindly shared with us the recipe for their British Lager. Jeremy, can you tell me a little bit about this recipe and why you decided to share this with us? Yeah, of course. Um, so the premium British lager, uh, the beer that we're brewing today, is our is our biggest seller. So when most people think of lager, they imagine something that's sort of golden in color, crisp, easy drinking, and accessible. And uh, and and this recipe fits that bill perfectly. So it's a it's a German style Helles. Um, so it's got a bit of malt character. It's got a bit of hop, but not a ton. Um, it's just a really easy drinking uh, go-to lager. So the ingredients that you've got in this, you've got um, totally English ingredients yep. uh, and a very specific malt from Warminster. Can you tell me a little bit about that malt? Yeah, so um, traditionally the malts that, that come from Europe, from Germany, from the Czech Republic, uh, they've got a bit more nitrogen, so protein in them and they're less modified. Um, so the brewer still has to do some work with them. Um, and, and when you're making traditional lagers, our view is that using these slightly less modified malts, um, doing things like step mashing uh, in the brew house to process them is gonna create flavor. It's gonna result in a beer that's got better foam and more body than if we were to use let's say, uh, a, a pale malt uh, or an extra pale malt from a, from a traditional UK maltings. So you're following pretty much the traditional German and European style methods of brewing these styles of beer? That's exactly what we're trying to do. And um, you know, our, our commitment to, to using British ingredients, a, a, a big part of that is about sustainability. It's about food miles, um, not shipping barley and hops around the world. Um, and, uh, and it's been quite a process, you know, Warminster have really been working together with us to create the malt that we want, which we think is going to make uh, a really good Hellas style. So the hops that you're using in this, again, you're not using traditional German or Czech varieties of hops, you're using British hops. Exactly. So, um, yeah, with that, I mean, we're using the, the two quintessential aroma hop varieties from England. So we're using Fuggles and East Kent Goldings. The, the way that I see those two hops is they are the noble hops of England. Um, if you look at Fuggles specifically, so Fuggles, when it's grown in Slovenia, it's Styrian Goldings, which, um, which goes in a ton of different lagers being brewed in Austria. If you look at Fuggles being grown in the US, all of a sudden it becomes US Tetninger. And it's essentially a noble hop from America. Um, so Fuggles uh, especially, but also EKG, they have a lot of these properties. You know, they're not overpowering. They're not excessively fruity. Um, they, they are very noble-like in their characteristics, which is why, um, which is why we've, we've got both of those in this lager. But you're not also just sticking to those kind of classic styles and classic hops. You're also using some of the new stuff, like you're using Olicana. Jester, yeah, yeah. Harlequin, yeah, yeah. Et yeah so, so there again, it, it comes down to aroma. If you, if you smell, uh, you know, Olacana uh, or, or Godiva, I mean, we, we absolutely love those hops. They're, they're filled with, with fruit, with, um, you know, sort of pine type American aromas. Uh, so we see a huge potential for using the, these, these new English hops. Uh, which are being bred at the moment. Coming from outside, I like, could almost think, well, actually, if you're only using the British ingredients, is that going to limit what you'll do? But actually, you've got a, a collection of ingredients that other people aren't using to the extent you're using. Yeah. So you've got this amazing creative freedom with things that are very accessible. Exactly. You can, you can, you can look at it as, as, as like a restraint. Um, but I think most brewers who make American IPAs, they're in in incredibly restrained because they're all just using Citra, Mosaic, um, Simcoe, you know? They, they've yeah. got the same four hops that they're using in all of their IPAs, and then a new hop will come out, and then they're all using that hop. You know, we're, we, we have to try and imagine 
you know, how are we going to build those flavors with, with what we have now? So I think, um, I think the restraint causes a ton of creativity. You know, I've had to think about raw materials in a completely different way where, you know, if you're, if we were brewing, if I was brewing a Helles five years ago, I would have just, okay, uh, I'll go to my favorite German maltings, I'll order the, the German Pilsner malt that they do and, yeah. and get a classic, you know, Helles style beer from it. And the second that isn't an option, all of a sudden you have to have an understanding for what makes a German lager malt German. Um, and, and how can we recreate that in the UK? You know, you have to think about raw materials in a different way to build flavors differently. Um, so, so I don't think it inhibits creativity at all. No, I mean, I can see the excitement in your face yeah. when you're actually talking about these ingredients and what they actually can achieve. So, Jeremy, let's talk a little bit about the specific considerations of this recipe in terms of how are we going to brew it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so for, uh, for the Hellas style lager, we're starting with really soft water here in Devon, um, which we're going to add a bit of salts to, um, but, but nothing too crazy. And then we're going to use a, a step mash. Um, so because we're starting with under modified malt or less modified malt, uh, essentially that just means that not all of the starch is ready, readily available from the grain to be broken down and turned into sugar. So we've got to do some of that work during mashing. So that's why we're starting at like 55 and then kind of... That's why we're gonna start at, uh, I think, 52 degrees. Okay. So we'll mash in at 52 degrees where, where uh, enzymes which break down proteins are active. So we're gonna get some, some protein breakdown at that initial stage. And then we're gonna bring the temperature up to uh, about 62 degrees and our beta amylase, so one of the, one of the, uh, the the starch converting enzymes is going to be quite active at that temperature. And uh, instead of doing where you traditionally have a single step, like let's say 67 degrees yeah. or 68, right? We're going to do 62 and then 72. So we're sort of using, you've got two enzymes, beta and alpha amylase, which are breaking down the starches. And we're going to hit both of them at their optimum temperatures, which means we got a really highly fermentable wort. So the uh, Helles style should be reasonably dry. It should be highly fermented. Um, so, so that's essentially why we're why we're doing this more complex mash. Um, and the the mashing in at 50 degrees, where you're getting protein action, that's just going to help build flavor, body. Um, and, and, and give the beer more of a typical German style flavor, continental flavor. Okay, so both those enzymes have a different temperature that they work best at. Yeah. What stops them from overdoing the job? Is there anything? That... So, so um, yeah, you, you, can you we go can, too far with the process? You, you can't really because enzymes have like a, have a half life essentially. So when you hit their temperature optimum, so beta amylase at like 62 degrees, right? It's gonna start working like crazy fast, but after half an hour, essentially the enzyme at the same time that is active is also being denatured by the heat. So the heat slows it down. And when we get up to 72 degrees, the alpha amylase is going to start working like crazy. And it'll work like crazy for about 10 minutes and then it'll start dropping off. So you get um, diminishing returns. So there's a natural drop off. So even if we carried on there for like an hour, it's not going to... It's, yeah, it's not really going to do much except that the, the entire time that you're sitting hot, let's say at 72 degrees, you are still building color. Even if you're not, you know, boiling it, um, but you, yeah, all, just due to the thermal reaction, you're still going to build color in that, which is flavor as well. Yeah. So, so we do a, a 30 minute rest at 72 degrees, which is significantly longer than our than our alpha amylase enzyme is active for. Um, but you've got another thing happening at 72 degrees, which are uh, glycoproteins are. are are being formed, so that's a, um, a sugar and a protein molecule, and they've been shown to increase the head and the body, so the, the texture, the mouthfeel of the beer. So that's kind of doing the job of adding some carapils would do, but you're actually doing it all with your standard malt. Yeah, exactly. 
exactly. We're, we're trying to do everything with our standard malt. Um, Carapils, something like that's really under modified, so m massively under modified. Um, and, uh, and if you use too much carapils, you can sort of get a bit of a raw grain character. So yeah, essentially what we're trying to do, we've got 100% Pilsner malt, which is what you use to make Hellas. That's just the way that it is. And uh, if we wanted to, to do a single infusion mash, you know, you can add things. You can add carapils, you can add some wheat, you can add some oats. But that's Essentially, not the traditional way. But, but that's not the way to do it. You know, that's, um, that works in a New England IPA. You want body, you throw in a bunch of oats. But at the same time, you're gonna get flavor from that, which doesn't fit in a 4.9% in a, in a Hellas, you know? All right, well, it looks like uh, you're up to strike temperature, ready to mash in. Just give me a shout if you need a, if you need a hand. Brilliant, cheers, thanks, Jeremy. Cheers. So, what are our first steps here? Okay, we've got our 35 litre kettle. Yep. We've hooked it up to our pump and our whirlpool system. Um, it's got the two kilowatt element in it. So we can do a step mash in there here because we've connected it up to an ink bird. So we can set the ink bird uh, at whatever temperature we want, which means that we can, we're supposed to do this in at 52 degrees. We're at about 50, five at the moment yeah. the the grain will take that down to 52. once we doed in we can then put the whirlpool back on so that it's recirculating and we can turn the element on obviously that's connected to the ink bird and then we can start doing our temperature rises okay so we're ready to put the bag in the kettle right. and we can just turn the whirlpool off just while we're doing that so we don't need to turn the pump off we can just turn it off there yeah, yeah, the pump will just carry on, but we are going to put it just so it's like that underneath okay. there. So that helps underneath. Just so that it can uh, it can rotate. So let's cut the bag open. This is the Warminster Czech style Utopian lager malt as the base. Wow, that's to be able to use this is absolutely fantastic. And there's also uh, there's also a touch of Munich in there as well then. So, because we're um, we're here at the brewery, so we're sort of mobile brewing here. We brought our kit, we brought our kit along. Um, we're brewing in the easiest way we possibly can, so. I guess this kind of shows that actually you don't have to have a dedicated brew space. Just how easy it is, yeah. So we're not gonna sparge this, are we? No, we're just gonna use the full volume. Use the full volume, yeah. Right, we've doed in at 52. We've now set the imp bird to reach 62. 62. So we're uh, it will heat up to 62. We're going to hold it there for 10 minutes. We're then going to set the ink bird to 65 and we're going to hold it there for 15 minutes. Then we will set it to 72 and hold it there for 30 minutes. And that's to encourage the enzymes that Jeremy talked about. We're trying to replicate the flavour that they're doing and also the fermentation profile to set the correct sugars within the mash. So we've come to the end of our mash period. We have gone through all of the temperature steps and times it's time to pull the melt bag out so that we can separate the mash from the liquor yep. and then we can boil with our hops oh. Crack on. right so i'm going to drop it in here and then we can pick up the run-ins swap them back in before we get to the boil okay well i'm going to change the temperature and push this now up to 100 degrees Martin, we've had the mash bag in this fermenting bucket. Yep. Um, the remaining liquor in there has come out. We've ended up with about a litre and a half or so in here. We're going to put this back into the boil kettle now. We we'll just pop that in. We've done our pre-boil gravity reading using a refractometer. The gravity reading is 1044. And we're aiming for a... 10.48 is our targeted. 10.48 is our, the original gravity that we're aiming for. So actually we're on target here. Yeah. So we're going to put the lid back on, wait for it to come to the boil, at which point we'll take the lid off, and then we'll add our hops. Well, we're up to the boil point now, so it's time to add our hops. What are we add in? Uh, first work hops are 30 grams of foggles. Excellent. We'll have further hop additions to do throughout the boil. What actually are those? Uh, so we've got uh, East Kent Goldens going at 30 minutes yep. and more Foggles again at 10 minutes. Okay, and always remember that's from the end of the boil. Yes. So we're just a couple of minutes before the end of the boil. Protoflock have gone in, yeast nutrient have gone in. 
Time to get the chiller in. Chiller's now in. That will sanitise during the last couple of minutes of the boil. And then we can call the work. So our work chiller's in, chilling the work down. All that's left for us to do is to drain it into the fermenter, hightail back to Swindon, where we can ferment it back at Maltmiller HQ. Yeah, I don't know about you, Rob, but I've learnt a lot today, just having the time to talk to Richard and Jeremy. They've both been hugely generous with their knowledge, um, imparting that knowledge to us and to our customers has been absolutely fantastic. The tips and hints that we've uh, picked up that we can put into this video and give to our customers is going to be fantastic. I yeah. can't wait to actually ferment this beer out and, uh, and see what the final product turns out like. Please make sure, if you haven't already, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell for notifications. Also, follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And please remember to check back in a couple of weeks where we're going to be making the comparison between the beer we brewed and the Utopian version.